Okay, so I, I don't know if I have the title, but I'm going to talk about a few things, transverse links in S3 and the interplay between the contact topology and the braid monodromy of the braid representing that link, and how this monodromy, the properties of the monodromy affect Hegel fluid transverse invariance. Okay, so this is sort of the title. Before I start, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing all of this. All right, so let's start just to set up what we are doing. We are looking at transverse knots and contact manifolds. I put in the genre just because I thought the genre are more familiar, but by now I think transverse knots are more familiar after John's lectures. And all, everything we are doing will be happening in R3 in the standard contact structure, which is again the contact structure familiar from John's lectures. It will be this rotationally symmetric contact structure that where the contact planes are horizontal along the z-axis and then they rotate out as you go out in the radial direction. Okay, so uh, the theory of transverse knots, you can think about just the topology, the topological type of the knot, and you can think about this basic self-linking invariant, but uh, there's a very rich theory beyond this, a lot of fine invariants, and my talk will touch on this just a little bit. Okay, so what I will be doing, I will be thinking about transverse knots as braids. Again, this is very familiar after John's lectures, and more precisely, what we need is two things. First off, every transverse link can be isotoped into a transverse braid around the z-axis. That's an example. And if two links are transversely isotropic, so you're looking at two braid representatives, you want to compare those, you can show that braid representatives can be related by braid isotopies and what's called positive Markov stabilizations and destabilization. So this is the picture. You're essentially adding an extra strand and a positive cross set. So this is this is it. So, in fact, a lot of small uh, small statements and facts, and maybe bigger statements are theorems. I'm not going to be able to give a reference to the precise person who proved it every time, just because make my talk more complicated, so, so longer. So I'll just apologize for everybody who I did not mention. So, anyways, this is the setting, and as John already talked about, the self-linking number is the invariant that can be computed from the braid representation. Uh, you count the number of positive crossings minus number of negative crossings minus the braid index number of strands. And if you look at this formula, if you look at the positive mark of stabilization, what we said you're adding one strand, you're adding one positive crossing. So this does not change the self thinking number. So it shouldn't if it's the same transverse node. On the other hand, if you are doing this, what's called a negative mark of stabilization, so add one strand and put in a negative crossing, then self thinking number goes down by two. And so you've changed your node, and we will need those the situation as well. In this case, if you did this negative Markov move, then the new transverse link is called transverse stabilization of your original link. All right. And as I mentioned, there's a rich theory beyond just looking at the smooth isotopy and looking at self-thinking number. There are a lot of situations where there are pairs of transverse nodes that are the same smooth node the same self-linking number, but one is not isotopic to the other through transverse knots. So as transverse knots, they're different. Uh, by now, there are quite a few ways to detect this. One of the first invariants that could see this phenomenon was an invariant of oshwitz and thurston in knot flow homology, and I will tell you a little bit about what this is. Okay. So I want to talk about this invariant, so I better tell you what it is. So I'll do a little bit of crash course in knot for homology. So before we do any homology, let's, so first of all, let's define knot for homology group. And it's going to be a bi-graded group. I'm going to do a stripped down version of this. So I'm actually not going to talk about gradings. I'm, I'm going to do Zemo2 coefficients. So maybe we are building a Zemo2 vector space. And we start with a smooth knot in S3. Again, there are more general versions. This is just the one I'm interested in for now. And so you start with a link. You want to make, you want to represent it as a braid. So it's an isotopic to a closed braid. And for now, I will just draw my braid from bottom to top. And then you put it in this kind of square position that I have out there in blue. And then once you have this kind of square thing, you can put it on what's called a grid diagram. So you can encode, the upshot is that you can encode your smooth link 
by a picture, which is essentially an n, uh, n by n grid, and then you have one, uh, one x, one o in each row and each column, and this encodes the node, because if I erase the node but just had axes and O's, I can give you the rule, so you connect axes to O's vertically and horizontally. Horizontal strands go over vertical strands, like I've drawn, and then vertically you connect axes to O's. If the O is above X, then you go in the grid. If, uh, so if O is above X, you go in the grid. If X is above O, you go out like I've drawn, so you get this kind of grid picture. Right? So any smooth knot can be encoded like this by a grid diagram. And then from a grid diagram, we want to construct the homology theory. We want to construct a chain complex. And so what you do is, first off, you look at this grid and you define the generators of your chain complex. And the generators are going to be n-tuples of grid intersections. So you pretty much, you're not looking at X's and O's anymore. You're not looking at the cells of the grid diagram, but you're looking at the lines and the intersections between the lines. And you want to pick one dot on each horizontal line one uh, and on each vertical. So you get pictures like this. You're actually thinking of the grid as a torus, so you identify top and bottom and uh, the two, uh, two sides so that, you know, if you use the top part, you're not using the bottom. So the examples, the red and blue, the X and the Y are two generators of the chain complex. Making sense? So just, just from the grid diagram, you get a lot of these, I guess, n factorial of these generators. Right? So these are the generators associated to a particular grid picture. Uh, what's the boundary map in the homology? What's the differential? Well, the differential is defined by a rectangle count. And you want to say, well, now I have a generator. I just need to define the differential on the generators. And U of Y is going to be a sum of other generators with some coefficients that I need to describe again. Right? And so what we say is that the X, another generator X, is going to enter into the expression for the generator Y if X and Y differ in exactly two positions. So this is actually the case in my picture over there. You flip two points. Uh, two reds into two blues, and the rest stay there. And then uh, the coefficient counts the number of rectangles that connect X and Y in the way I've drawn. So X should be the bottom left and, to, and the, the, the top left and bottom right corner, and the Y should be the two other corners, two opposite corners. And the rectangles are required to be empty, which means that there are no X's, no O's, and no marked points, no components of X and Y. Right. So I have to say for the experts, I'm lying a little bit. I'm not defining H of K hat. I'm defining something that I think called maybe H of K twiddles, which sort of depends on the size of the grid diagram. And in fact, this is not the sort of the usual knot floor homology. This is the homology of the mirror of the knot. But these are small technical points that are not too important. This is, this is, this is the version that I want to look at. Right. It's easy to extract and variant out of this picture. Okay. Any questions about what this not for homology is? So this is one of the versions. This is a combinatorial version, which is actually not how they first defined it. First definition due to Oswald and Sabo was by homomorphic disks, but this combinatorial picture is due to Manalescu, Oswald, and Sarkar. Is how I took it. Any questions about what we are defining? All right. So now we have the homology associated with smooth knot. I said we wanted to talk about transverse knots. So how about transverse knot? Now you have a transverse knot. It's still, you know, you can still represent it as a braid, like I said, except that you have a more limited uh, choice of representatives because you want to, you actually care about the transverse knot structure. And the invariant that you can define is a distinguished element in the knot homology. Again, it's the homology of the mirror knot that you're really looking at, <coughs> never mind. And what you do, you want to define a distinguished element of the knot complex, a distinguished cycle that would descend to the element in homology. And the resulting element in homology is independent of choices, because of course you could get a different braid representative for a transverse knot, but you want to see you end up with sort of essentially the same element in homology. And this is, again, combinatorially sort of easy to say what it is, because you have a picture of axes and O's, which again, going back and code your braid and code your transverse node. 
And you look at a particular generator, which is given by the upper right uh, corners of axis. So in my picture, I just have these diagonal red dots. In some, some other picture, you would have, again, the corners of axis. Uh, it's easy to see that this is a cycle that, so the axis tell you that you cannot build any rectangles that would contribute to differentials, uh, differentials going from theta. So it's a cycle, and then it defines an element in the homology. Okay. And despite this kind of easy definition that I was able to say in five or 10 minutes, uh, there are many, it turns out a very powerful invariant. There are many examples of knots where, uh, where this invariant exactly sees this phenomenon of two knots being smoothly isotopic same self-linking number, but not transversely isotopic, because for one node, the invariant is zero. For example, for the other node, the invariant is non-zero. Right? So that's, that's the situation that can be easily detected by a computer, at least if you know what to look for. If, if you sort of have two appropriate ca candidates, then this invariant can be easily computed by, by a machine. Right? OK, so this is this part of my talk, and I want to tell you how the properties of these invariants are going to be related to braid monodromy. And this is sort of really linking the story to low dimensional topological properties of transverse knots and relating contact topology to things that come from low dimensional topology. OK, before we go there, I want to mention a couple of important properties of this transverse invariant that will be important to us. One property, remember we said we can do positive Markov moves that do not change the knot. We can do these negative moves that are called transverse stabilization. So if you look at this transversely stabilized knot, it turns out that the invariant vanishes. It's not too hard to show. And the other property that will be important is that you can say what happens when you kill a positive crossing in your braid. So I have a picture. You have a knot K plus that has a particular positive crossing, and then I remove that crossing, and I just have this resolution, and it's a knot K. It's another transverse braid. So the knot my homology is functorial, and if I have a crossing resolution, if I have a sort of this operational knots, it induces, in, it induces a map on knot for homology, and it turns out that this invariant, the transverse invariant, behaves nicely with respect to this crossing resolution, namely the invariant of the knot with the extra positive crossing is mapped to the invariant of the smooth out node. All right. So I think this, this uh, positive crossing resolution property is due to John Bolton. The rest of the properties are due to Ojo, Zabo, and Thurston, who developed this transverse invariant. All right. Any questions? Okay. So like I said, there are many examples where you can use this data to detect interesting information. But for now, I would like to ask a different question, address this question in my talk. So what kind of information does theta C for an individual knot? Because it might be not too enlightening. You say, well, there are two knots, and theta is 0 for one knot, not 0 for the other knot. So what kind of information does theta C, and how do you say, how do you see if theta is 0 or non-0? And it turns out that the answer is related to braid monodromy. And some of it was known, actually, before I started doing you know, the story, but, but anyways, I can contribute a little more. And I find that the proof is pretty interesting, I'm going to tell you, because it relates the braid monodromies of the geometric properties, the topological properties of the braid, and combinatorics of braid diagrams. And then it go also goes through grid diagrams approach to knot homology. All right. So what is it that I'm going to prove? I have these results that if, first off, let's look at just transverse three braids. So it turns out that this invariant is non-zero precisely if and only if, if the braid monodromy, the braid twists to the right. It's called right veering. I'll give you an exact definition in a moment, but so sort of the idea is that the braid twists to the right. So the real substance of my theorem, I think, is going that way because that way was some flavors of it at least was already were already known. And similarly, if if you have a transverse braid of bigger than you know bigger size, then I don't know. It's not true that it, if it's right here and then the invariant is non-zero. But still, if you 
know that the braid has enough positive twisting, so in a sense more positive twisting than just like a full positive twist of the braid, then this theta invariant is non-zero. Right? And like I said, it's not if you, at least if you're not asking the right question, it's easy to come up with some kind of stupid examples where you have something right here and it vanishes invariant just because you can take a braid where you know the invariant will vanish, and then you build those positive mark of stabilization. So you just find a braid representative that's kind of formally right veering, but the, the node still has vanishing invariant. And I still don't know, maybe you should, the right question to ask is, what if I know that all braid representatives are right veering? Can I show that this is not vanishing? I don't know how to prove it. I don't have counterexamples. This might be interesting. But this is sort of the statements. I wanted to ask if there are any questions, but before I told you what the definitions are, I don't know if there can be questions. So let me give you the definitions, what I mean by this right veering. Uh, so again, right veering, the idea of right veering has a long story. It I think people already mentioned it in the open book context and in the open books it's known it was developed a theory developed by Honda Kazes and Matic that right wearing properties of open books are related to tightness of the contact structure. And I think even before that the sort of the idea of looking at the monodromy and wearing to the right or to the left, I think it goes back to, to Thurston. So that's that's an old idea. And for braids, uh, this right wearing property, except a slightly different definition, was studied by Bolden, Gertesh, and Velovic. And there's also some more work, I think, that I don't mention. All right, so, anyways, this is the definition. So, the definition is simple. You just want to think about what the monodromy does. And, like I said, you want to say it twists to the right. So, what does it mean more precisely? You look at all possible arcs, like whatever arc you like from the boundary of the disk, so no, 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 you think of the braid as acting on the punctured disk, right? This is one of the ways to think about braids. One of the ways to think about the braid group is to identify it with the mapping class group of a punctured disk. So now let's see what this monodromy does. If you look at an arc, look at the image of this arc, and you want to say every arc gets twisted to the right. So if you compare the original arc and the image of or that you get after the monodromy, the image should lie to the right uh, of the original arc, you know, with respect to the given orientation of the disk. Of course, you can say, well, how about what do you mean it lies to the right? I can always just make this extra kink I have drawn here, and then it would be to the left. But before you decide whether it's to the left or to the right, you pull the arcs to remove the essential intersections. So you really want to think about this kind of idea. And that one more remark, if you are looking at the identity map, then the identity map accounts as right here and just by definition. So I said if B of A is A, then it's all right. Okay, so this is the definition of right wearing. Uh, examples, if you just compose your braid out of positive twists in the disk, positive half twists, then yeah, definitely it's going to be right wearing. So in particular, all positive braids, all braids with just positive crossings, or all quasi-positive braids, if you know what those are, these are all right-wearing braids. And for some non-right-wearing, if you look at this transversely stabilizing and negative mark of stabilization braid, then pretty clear you add an extra strand, you add an extra point in the puncture disk, and you add a negative left, left uh, sort of clockwise, left, left-handed half twist. So this means that you're getting something which is non-right-wearing. Right? that particular arc, last arc goes, gets twisted to the left. Any questions about the definition? So, okay, so I would like to now make a detour to talk about orderings on the braid group, to talk about durability for two reasons. One, one reason it's related to this idea of right wearing, and second, it will actually play a major role in the proof of my theorem. So I think it's, it's interesting. So now the detour, you can use the idea similar to the sort of right wearing to prove this nice fact that the braid group is orderable. So what does the orderable mean? Well, first you want to order it as a set. You want to say there is a linear order. Well, you know, it's not too hard to just make a linear order on the set, but you want the order to be compatible with the group operation. So you want to be 
I think it's right invariant. If beta 1 is greater than beta 2, you multiply by gamma, then you get that beta 1 gamma is greater than beta 2 gamma. So, so let's, let's explain how to build a, an ordering on the break group. So because of this uh, invariance, uh, you, can, you don't have to define what it means for beta 1 to be greater than beta 2. You can just say, what does it mean for a braid to be greater than the identity of braid? What does it mean beta greater than 1? And to define this, you can consider what the monodromy does to the x-axis. So for me, x axis, you know, you just assume that you you're looking at the standard puncture disk where all the punctures are on the x axis, right? And then you kind of draw, draw this line through the punctures. You act by the monodromy, and the punctures go to punctures, but perhaps, you know, there's some permutation, and the x axis goes to some kind of curve like the one I've drawn, right? And then you look at whether this x axis veers to the right of its original position or it veers to the left. The only place that you're actually looking at is this point on the left-hand side where, you know, where I say, look here, just this kind of, this initial point of the x-axis. And then you say, well, let's define that beta is greater than the identity braid if it's VS, if the x-axis veers to the right. Let's define that beta is less than one if x-axis goes to the left. And you can see actually that this is well defined because, because uh, a bit of x-axis can only leave the x-axis fixed if this is the identity braid, right? If all the punctures stay fixed, if this x, if this, if this x axis stay fixed, then the bottom disk and the top, to bottom half disk and the top half disk also stay fixed up to isotopy, so it works out. And it's actually not, not hard to check that this gives a required ordering, that you have transitivity, right? If you were to the right and then you twist more to the right, then you, you know, it's to the right. And it's easy to see that this also has this invariance property. Pretty much of this on the definition. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So now there's another way to define a braid order, and I think this is a piece of kind of history of mathematics that I find interesting because the ideas of right veering, like I said, are sort of due to Thurston and they were studied by his group, but I think they were not terribly interested in sort of braid groups and defining order. But people who study the braid groups from the more algebraic perspective were more interested in the, these questions. And then the first, the the first theorem that showed that the braid group BN is orderable was uh, proved by a guy called Dior Noir, and it was proved from the algebraic perspective by an actually mi much harder construction than this right theory idea that I just described. But I will need both. I will need the interplay between this geometric idea and the braid word idea to prove, to prove the transverse invariance here. Okay. So what did Diarno do? He, say, he said, we define, again, we define that the braid is greater than the identity if this braid admits a particular braid word representative, something that he calls sigma positive. So what's sigma positive? Sigma positive could be like sigma 1 positive, sigma 2 positive, sigma 3 positive, where sigma i is, of course, this refers to the standard generators. I hope everybody is familiar with the basic structure of the red group, but you know, sigma i is just this crossing on the level between the i-th strand and the i plus 1 strand. So every braid can be decomposed into these individual crossings and the inverses. This is how these are the generators. So sigma one positive means that you have a braid word. Now, this is not at the level of the braid. This is an actual braid word. Uh, you have a braid word where sigma one enters with positive exponents only. So you can have like sigma one, sigma one to any positive exponent. You cannot have sigma one and negative, with negative exponent. So that's sigma two, sigma one to the fourth, and ever, whatever is a sigma one positive word. There are no restrictions on other generators. Now, what's sigma 2 positive? Well, maybe your word doesn't have any sigma 1 at all, and then you look at the next generator that comes in. You look at sigma 2, and then sigma 2 has to come in with positive exponents only. So again, that's an example. And more generally, sigma i positive means that you don't have any sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma i minus 1. But the first generator that's there is sigma i, that enters with positive exponents only. OK. And now, it turns out that if you define the ordering by saying that your braid is greater than the identity, if it admits a sigma-positive braid and then extend this 
uh, extend this uh, to just defining beta, beta 1 greater than beta 2 by Hughes invariance, then this gives a well-defined ordering. And I have to say this is completely not obvious. Even just saying that you cannot be greater than 1 or less than 1 at the same time, it would require proving that you cannot, that your braid can't admit two braid words at the same time, one of which would be sigma positive and the other would be sigma negative. It's not obvious and it's actually non trivial to prove. So the theorems that Dierno approved, it's like a long, long combinatorics of the braid words and sort of algebra and everything. It's, it's, it's a lot of work. Okay. So why do I care about this? Well, because it turns out that this uh, combinatorial approach and the geometric approach, they define the same ordering. So it's a theorem of five people. I actually put the names out the, uh, up there because I can never remember. Uh, so the, the being sigma positive is the same, having admitting a word that sigma positive is the same as geometrically sending the x axis to the right of itself. So one direction is actually easy. So if you know that you are sigma positive, like sigma 1 positive, what does this mean, right? So it means that the first two points, the first two pun punctures, are only going to be twisted in one direction. So of course, it means that the x-axis is going to go to the right, all right? And if you are something like sigma 3 positive, that my se that's my second picture, for a while you are not touching the x-axis. The first couple of punctures are uninvolved, but when you are starting to actually do something, then you're twisting to the right. So again, it's clear that the x-axis veers to the right of itself. Going in the other direction is less obvious. It's also, it's not like terribly profound, but you have to basically say that if you, you have to say that if you veer to the right, then you can sort of decompose your braid into stages and actually find a representative which is sigma positive. That's how it goes. All right, any questions? So upshot for us is going to be useful because we can now interpret this right wearing and non-right wearing properties uh, why combinatorics of the braid words. And you know, the Seger flow invariance, at least the way I described it, it, you can say something if you understand the combinatorics. It's harder to say things just from the monodromy, even though there's a description of the transverse invariant in terms of more of fitting more of the braid picture due to Bold and Delavik and Vertesche. But even so, if you're trying to prove something directly from this kind of braid monodromy picture, it's harder. It turns out to be harder than using the combinatorics here. All right. So now, uh, what exactly is the relation between right wear and non right wear and appropriate braid words? Uh, because, see, this, uh, when we define the ordering, we just cared about what the monodromy does to the x axis. That's different from being right wearing. Because right wearing, you say every arc has, has to wear to the right. Uh, this x axis, you just look at this one distinguished x axis, you have no idea what other arcs are doing. I mean, maybe definitely there are some other arcs that are not that are not veering to the right. All right, but now what you can say, uh, it's easier to go backwards. Suppose you have a braid which is not right veering. So what does it mean? It means that there is an arc that twists to the left, right? But then you can use the conjugacy, you can use the self diffeomorphism of the disk to send this kind of weird arc, whatever this arc is, to the standard arc that connects the boundary of the disk to the first puncture. So the, the arc that's part of the x axis. And then you say, all right, after this conjugacy, I'm going to get that the part of the x-axis goes to the left. Right? And that means that you have something else negative in the Diorna ordering. And that means that for this particular uh, conjugate, there's going to be a sigma 1 negative word. Right? And now, eventually, I'm going to talk about closed braids. So if I did conjugacy, then it doesn't matter. It didn't ch change my closed braid. So if I had a closed braid, which has a non-right wearing effect on the disk, it means that I can find a sigma 1 negative word representing the same braid, representing the same transverse knot, eventually. All right. Any questions? All right. So again, just to emphasize this a little more, uh, I have a transverse link now represented by a non-right wearing braid. So it means that I can find a braid representative that is, like we said, sigma 1 negative. And to make a picture, uh, it means that the crossings on the sigma 1 level, the crossings of the kind of top row of my braid, all have to be negative crossings. 
They might come in a few clusters. They might be like one or more than one crossings at a time, but they all must be negative crossings. The rest of the braid, I don't know what's going on, but this is the picture. So now you can use this and the properties of the theta invariant to prove that any non-right variant braid has a vanishing variant. And like I said, a version of this with a slightly different definition is due to Bold and Velavik and Verteshi and uh, using the same idea, kind of the same braid ordering idea in the context of Kalanov homology to prove a similar statement is due to Bold and Grigsby. So this is really not new, but I just want to show you how this works. So we know that this, this functoriality and chirality property that if you get rid of a positive crossing in your braid, then you go to then the invariant of the sort of braid with an extra positive crossing is mapped to the invariant of the braid with the crossing smoothed out. Right? You could also turn it into the statement about negative crossings just because you can, oops, you can make this picture, you can introduce a pair of positive and negative crossing, and then you kill the positive crossing. And so it means that you can go from just no crossing at all to the negative crossing. And the invariant of one braid with no crossing will be mapped to the invariant of the braid with the negative crossing. Right? So use this. And so now it's clear what you can do. Because you have this kind of complicated picture, you can get rid of negative crossings until you only have one of those left. So then you have one of those left, but you know that this is just a transverse stabilization. This is a negative mark of stabilization. So we said that the invariant of that guy is zero. And then this zero gets mapped to this theta of the more complicated braid that we're interested in. So this theta should also be zero. That's the proof. Right. So it's really, I don't know how to, I mean, you can prove it from, from the monodromy, but it's sort of nice that you can, you can just just use the formal properties and see what, what's happening here. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So now I want to prove the other, the actual sort of theorem that I proved that the invariant is non-vanishing as long as you look at the braid with enough positive twisting. Okay. So how do you do this? So again, you want to play with this naturality, and you want to say, how about if I reduce my question to a braid, which is like a standard model, right? So I can start with my braid, and I can, I can get rid of some positive crossings, and then I can get something that's maybe simpler to work with. Right? So let's see. Let's maybe see what, what I want to do. So, uh, uh, I'm looking at a braid with more twist and a full positive twist. For me, I think that will just, uh, the, for the experts, I can state this in a statement about the fractional day twist coefficient. But for simplicity, let's just say right away, this is equivalent to saying that I have a full positive twist in my braid, and then I have something that's right viewing. Right? So this is the picture. Right? And then I want to say I can obtain my braid from this kind of standard model where you have one strand crossing everything, going around everything positively with one positive twist. And then this braid is not involved in the rest of the braid. This strand is not involved. But the rest of the, the remaining strands make a number of full negative twists. Right? So this has a bunch of positive crossings and a whole lot of negative crossings. So what I claim is that you're looking at something like this. You're looking at a picture where you have a full positive twist. Then you have something that's right veering, so sigma positive. So maybe you have positive crossings on the first level, or maybe nothing at all. Right? So you have positive crossings at the first level. You can get rid of those. Uh, and if you have any other stuff in the bottom level, you can, re you can get rid of all positive crossings, and you can introduce additional negative crossings. So what you've shown is this lemma that I have. That any braid that has a full positive twist plus something right theory can be obtained from this model braid shown in green by inserting extra positive crossings. So for three braids, it's, a, it's an even simpler picture. You just have one strand that goes around positively, and then two strands that intersect, that, that, that twist negatively many, many times. Is this lemma making sense? So you just do this. And then, because we know that positive crossings uh, behave nicely with respect to the properties of theta, you know that 
theta of k, theta of your original braid, gets mapped to theta of this model braid, right? Under, under the corresponding map and homology. So if you can show that this guy is non-zero, you know that your original invariant was also non-zero. So now all we need to show is to prove the non-vanishing of the invariant for these mod for the, those model examples. How about two parameter family? It's the number of strands that can be anything and the number of full negative twists can be also anything you like. But it's sort of a still a simple family to work with. So then, I'm going to go to grid diagrams to prove this. Right? And so, now this looks huge. I don't know if you can see it. But so this is the diagram that I made is for the three breed that has, that is that model that, I, that I've shown that you have two, that you have this one strand going around positively and then a lot of negative crossings. And I hope you can see it. You have this one strand that goes around positively and then just zigzags near the other two strands, but it's not involved. And the other two strands have a lot of negative crossings between them, it has this twisting. Right? So you can put it on, you can take this braid, you can put, put it on the grid diagram. You can see there's a pattern for the three braid. You can continue indefinitely. With more strands, it's going to be a slightly different picture, but again, it's a very similar pattern that you could make. And then you say, well, now this, this theta invariant is represented by a particular cycle that's shown, that's shown by red dots. And I can ask, can I kill this invariant? Are there any differentials that I kill it? And you can stare at this diagram for a little bit. And it's actually not too hard to see just from the sort of layout of the diagram, just from the pattern that there are no rectangles that could possibly kill it. So what you're looking for, you're looking for this kind of uh, the red dots being the top left and bottom right corners and the rectangle kind of, uh, uh, connecting it to some other generator, some other points which would be the empty rectangle. But you can sort of see what can I do. If I go some of the red dot down, this kind of corner, if I go by more than like one step, I'm going to involve a, I'm going to involve a no in my rectangle. It's not going to be an empty rectangle. It's not going to work out, right? So for, for at least for, for points in the middle of the diagram, but these corners are also easy to see. And if I go just one step down, I could possibly, because my, my grid diagram lives on the torus, I could possibly wrap around the diagram and come back on the other side and sort of make a rectangle right, like the one I have on the bottom. But that also involves a no, basically, because of the structure of the braid, because I always have a no to the right of an x. It always happens. So no matter what the size of this diagram, you see always that, well, there are just no empty rectangles. There are just no differentials that could kill this in the area. And that's, and that's a, an easy grid diagrammatic proof, which together with the sort of dear Noah story that just proves that if you have if you have enough positive twisting, then your braid has a non-vanishing variant. All right. So one thing, maybe I didn't say for the, for I said this is, this model is easy to reduce to if you have one full positive twist and then something right veering. For the three braids, I said it's true whenever your braid is just right veering, no extra restrictions. But with three braids, three braids are pretty simple. You just look at like Murasui classification, and you work with it a little bit, and you see that it still reduces to pretty much the same model. So that's that's the proof. We actually have a couple of minutes left, but I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. too late in the day. <laughs> okay, so maybe I should say this this non vanishing for right wearing uh, for right wearing things in in the open book story it has it has a, this a similar theorem that if you have an open book with connected binding and a monodrome which has enough twisting, so again, it involves a full positive twist around the boundary, then the contact invariant in the hair for homology does not vanish. And it's striking that uh, the proofs of you know, my theorem and that result, which is due to Honda, Kazis, and Machich, 
they're strikingly different. So what they use is they go the whole story of going from this particular open book, particular monodromy, to existence of taut foliations on the corresponding three manifold, and then turns out that the corresponding contact structure that comes from the open book is a perturbation of the taut foliation, and then it's weakly syntactically fillable, and then there's more machinery from Hegerfler homology that tells you that the contact invariant does not vanish. And in fact, you have to look at the contact invariant with twisted coefficients. I don't know if you have these results. I, I think it's not known if you just look at Zimo 2 coefficients. Uh, there's no way you could use that machinery for braids, at least I don't know how, because there's no taut foliation, like something associated with it. I don't know how to make it work. On the other hand, this is an easy combinatorial proof that's, that does not require twisted coefficients, so it's even a slightly stronger result. It would be very interesting to somehow port it to the open box picture to make like a corresponding combinatorial proof. I don't know how to do it. So it's like two very similar worlds, but the proofs are different. So that's the story. Okay. So no more questions, I guess. <laughs>